So last week I spent three painful days trying to get my Rodecaster Duo working properly so I could make a video for you to showcase its best features and in the end I decided I didn't want to get to vet Rode's mixer for them and decided to return it. So here's what I learned and you might be able to benefit from. Let's take a look. Firstly, this isn't a rant video and I've got no intentions of bashing Rode. I've used their Wireless Go for years now and I've been quite happy with them, but when it comes to Duo, it's a different story. Full disclosure, I bought the Duo and the Mixcast 4 with the intention of being able to use a handful of mics that I already have, augment the sound with the mixer, and then send the audio directly to my Sony cameras. And yes, I'm aware the M4 should be compared uh, to the Procaster 2, but this is the situation I found myself in, so I decided to run with it. It seemed like no matter what I tried with the Duo, I got weird humming, buzzing, hissing noises, both in the final recording and in the headphones. When I checked the forums to try and resolve the issues, it seemed clear that Rode may have rushed the Duo to production and the power bars have insufficient RF shielding. Now, whether that's true or not, I can't say, but the unit was way too problematic for me. The Rodecaster Duo itself is made primarily of plastic and doesn't feel as substantial as the M4 in my humble opinion, but it does have a smaller form factor and a vest mount provision on the back of it, which I thought was a nice touch. So now let's look at a key issue if you're like me and you want to take your audio directly to your camera. The Duo has no 1.8 3.5mm line out jack, so that means that you're going to need to attenuate the signal coming out of the quarter inch line out port on the back of the Duo because it's likely to be too hot for most DSLRs and Rode even states this on their website. So this means you need either an attenuator cable or an attenuator box to modify the signal going to your camera to preclude any weird buzzing or humming noises. The second thing I notice about the Duo is that it's really designed to work with Rode mics, even though it does have a Shure SM7B preset in addition to generic dynamic and condenser presets. My sense of this and what I would say to you is that if you have Rode mics, you might get great results from the Duo, but otherwise you'd likely benefit more from the M4 as I'm going to demonstrate for you right now. Okay, so I thought I would just cut right to the chase here and so I plugged in the M4. I've taken my 3.5 millimeter cable and I've run it to my Sony uh, FX30. I've got the XLR plugged in. I don't need the headphones for this. And if I left them plugged in and set on, I'd, I'd be distracted by the noise from the headphones. But so really all I had to do to get a, a decent audio signal is just take the two level bars here and run them up to the attenuation point here. And that's it. So, you know, before this clip, everything you heard was coming through Tascam DR60D, and now you're listening to uh, the M4. And so I think you'll notice a, 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 there's definitely a noticeable difference. This thing, this the uh, sound or, or the noise floor, it's so clean, the preamps on this thing. So that's what really impressed me a lot about it. And if I go into the voice setting here, you can see that I don't have any tone or compressor, no effects applied whatsoever. This is just the microphone. So if I turn this on, I've got a number of things I can do. So firstly, I can tap on the deep tone. Hey guys, Paul here with Patek testing one, two, three, four, five. I can try the mid tone. Hey guys, Paul here with Patek testing one, two, three, four, five. There's the bright tone. Hey guys, Paul here with Patek testing one, two, three, four, five. And then if I click on the manual, I also can go into the manual settings and I can play, there's the high shelf setting. There's the low, uh, low shelf setting. Hey guys, Paul here with Patek. Hey guys, Paul here with Patek. And then I can go back and switch to the mid-tones here. So you can definitely tell the difference. Okay guys, I thought the next um, common sense thing to do is let's see if we can take the MKE 600 and just enhance it a little bit and get something that, you know, you and I might like uh, a little better. And, you know, clearly this is going to be subjective. I might like the deep tone and you go, oh, my, that sounds like sure SM7B, perfect, that's what I'm after. So right now, here's a couple of seconds of silence. And that's because the noise suppressor is not on. So if I go into the number one setting here, and let's go into voice, we'll turn on the processing. There's the noise suppressor is, uh, suppressor is on. And 
My voice, personally, I can use a little bit of de-esser, for sure. And so now we've turned that on, which probably sounds a little better. And so, you know, just with those few changes, now if we go back and there's your deep tone, there's your Shure SM7B. Doesn't this sound, you know? <laughs> and then this is the mid-tone, and this is a little brighter. Um, and then we can even go further and go into manual. But I think you get the idea. And then you've got, you know, the compressor here. I mean, you can set it to there's soft, there's hard, and then you can go into manual and play till your heart's content. But this is probably... Um, I, I like the manual. I like the deep tone, the sound of the deep tone, but it's, I just find it's a little bit much for me. So this should be a good example of what you can do with this microphone. And the next thing I'm going to do is take another microphone that I've used for a long time, which is the AT-875R, and let's see what we can do with that one and then go from there. So next up, I've got the AT-875R, and I've put it in the same holder that I use for the Sennheiser, and I've taken all the effects off, I haven't touched the gain, and still the same two faders right in the exact same zero position, and this is what you get from the AT-875R. And, and this mic, I like the sound of it. Um, you know, it's got a richness to it for sure. And so uh, let's go in and we'll play with this one and see what we can do with it. So, uh, you know, the first thing would, would probably be we'll go in and turn on the processing. And let's turn off the de -esser. Now I'm going to... There's with the noise suppressor off. So the noise floor in this mic is definitely not as good as the Sennheiser. So turn the noise suppressor on, that makes a huge difference uh, in itself. And and this one, I, yeah, I'll turn the de on. It's just my voice, right? Like I can hear this all the time. So um, I think it's worth turning that on. And so now if we go back and turn on the tone, so this is the deep tone with the AT-875R. And uh, a lot of people will like this because it's very sure SM7B-esque, if you will. <laughs> uh, that's the way I would describe it. And this is the mid-tone. And this is the bright tone. Definitely brings in the, the you know, the voice uh, a little more. And then if we go into manual and, um, and maybe we'll turn on the compressor here. And so it's set to hard right now. So that's with hard compression. They're soft. Um, so you've got those adjustments as well. But I think let's just turn off the compressor for the moment. And let's go into manual and have a quick look here. Um, you know, the exciter is not turned on. Let's turn it on. So this is with the exciter turned on. I can hear it in the headphones. I mean, you, you know, this thing is very sensitive. And these headphones are AT. Um, I'll put the link in the description for you. But these are a decent set of headphones. And so to me, like the way it sounds right now, the exciter's making a bit of a difference. Um, that's pleasing to my ears. But so, so there you go. This is, um, you know, basically what the AT, A75 sounds like. If I go to the high shelf, there's the high shelf on it. And you can play with the frequency and gain here as well. Low shelf. Let's turn this down a bit. Testing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, if that's at 210 hertz, if I take it back to like, there's 610 hertz. Yeah, it's, it sounds good in headphones, but <laughs> you know, the end result is always listen to the playback through the studio monitors, to be quite honest, Fishy. So let's do that. Okay, so let's play with a couple of additional things here. I'm still with the 875R and if we go into the voice settings, so in the noise suppressor here, if you click on the tool icon, um, something to note is that you have to go to page two, um, you know, if you want to mess with the threshold for the noise suppressor. And I think this is important. I've seen, uh, you know, a few videos where guys are making a note that by default, um, let's put it over here someplace, like minus 36 dB. You can, yeah, it's too much, right? You can hear the voice kind of going in and out. So what I found is, you know, up around 48 or 50, 
seems to work pretty good. Uh, so just be aware of that. It's on page two in the noise suppressor setting. And then uh, the other thing that we might want to uh, just kind of show you here is, let's go back here, in, in the effect setting. So you've got, the first thing you'll see is reverb. And this thing you'll, you know, this is just kind of a, uh, you'll find this one interesting for sure. So when the reverb is turned on, and if we go into the tool settings, you've got a whole bunch of tools here, but you know, what you're gonna get from this is, I think you get the idea. Um, you know, and then you've got some settings here, room, live, studio, plate. So you can play around with this to your heart's content. It'll, you know, for YouTube videos, I'm not sure where I would use this. It might impress my grandkids, but um, yeah, so. And if I go back here and just turn the reverb off, and then the other thing that's, you know, the voice changer. This, this will definitely uh, get my grandkids' attention. Um, so you can play around with this one until your heart's content as well. And, you know, so this weekend when the grandkids show up, they're going to have some fun with this for sure. So. Again, coming back to reality, <laughs> um, you know, so far all I can tell you is that this thing is such a solid piece of kit. Oh my God, like the, it's just so easy to use and uh, for my workflow is going to be very beneficial. And the only drawback is, you know, the footprint on it, right? But um, I think where I'll use this is here in the studio, I've already demonstrated that the preamps are definitely cleaner than the Tascam DR60D. Now, DR60D2, I, I can't say I don't have it, but um, from what I've seen so far, this is one impressive piece of kit. And I've only got the gain, gain set at, you know, 26. You know, according to the manual, you're supposed to boost the gain, you know, way up into this range, that's too high. Um, it's supposed to be between the two yellow bars there, but I find like around 26 is, 26 or 27 is perfectly fine for what I'm doing. So there again, that's just another example. Okay, so in this uh, part of the video, what I'm gonna do is I've moved over to my desktop setup, which is a Dell uh, Alienware, you know, curved monitor. So this is where I do all my recording and stuff from. And I'm recording into Camtasia 2024. And this is uh, the Zoom ZDM1 going through the M4. And I'll compare this to my old Behringer. I think it's a UMC 204 HD. And, you know, in all fairness, this thing is like brand new and the Behringer is quite a bit older, but you'll, you'll hear the difference uh, when I do the comparison. But this is where this unit really shines. I mean, you can just take your USB-C cable, plug it into the PC. Um, the audio comes right into Camtasia and it's just so easy to work with, right? And then I can modify the audio uh, as I need to and it just gets better and better from there. Or I can switch over if I need two mic setup. Uh, or something like that. I have no real plans to do any podcasting, but I can definitely see the benefit. So for me, um, I'm probably jumping to the conclusion of this video, but you know, this M4 just gives me one system that is stone reliable and, you know, super quiet preamps and just gives me a really excellent uh, audio result for my recordings. And so now let's take a look at how it works, bringing it into the computer. Okay, so now that you've heard the ZDM1 going through the M4, and I haven't fine-tuned it to the way I'm ultimately going to use it, um, but it's, you know, just, you know, with minimal processing on it, it you know, there's a huge difference. And this is uh, what's coming out of the Behringer right now. I think it's a UMC 204 HD, something like that, and it's it's quite a bit older than the M4, as I mentioned earlier, but this is what it sounds like going through the Behringer as compared to what you just heard uh, coming out of the M4. All right, so we're in Camtasia now, and I'm just showing you the timeline here. And so basically what has happened is, you know, this recording here is Camtasia's recording on the top. It has the audio track, and this is my A7 IV track on the bottom. And so I just have the Deity D3 Pro there to give me a scratch track, and then I just sync the audio in, in post-production here, like line up the two audio waveforms and then get rid of one. And this is what I'm left with. So if I play this setup, which is a Dell, uh, Alienware, you know, curved monitor. And that's 
really going to be my primary use for this. For podcasting, uh, next I'll show you the app that comes with the M4 so that if you're going to record uh, with the M4 onto the SD card, then you've got a whole other uh, can of fish or and you've got a whole other app that you're going to be able to use uh, to do your podcasting. And, you know, the, the app is probably something that I'll never use. This is going to be the primary way I use this uh, device, but it's worth taking a look at for sure. Okay, guys, so we're going to take a quick look at the podcast editor. This won't be in-depth. I'm just going to show you one of the many things that you can do with it. And so I'm just going to click over here. I'm going to click on record. Hey guys, Paul here with Patek testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. And I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to say, are you sure? Yes. And then it's going to save it out as podcast 007 for me. Thank you very much. And I'll click OK. And so now if I come down to my, um, I'll have to go into the menu here because I'm recording the screen. So. T, 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 Tascam Podcast Editor. Takes a second to open up. There's a firmware update available, and I'm just going to read from the Mixcast. So it's going to read the SD card and bring it into the Podcast Editor software for me, which is kind of nice. And so it's uh, the last one on the list there, 007. Double click that. Takes a second to bring it up. maybe two seconds. And then if I just move this window up here a little bit so you can see it and I can click on play here. I don't have my system audio on, so you won't be able to hear it, but you know, this is the idea. So if you're going to be doing podcasting, Tascam has provided this free podcast editor so that you can have all these tracks, you know, you can record directly into the podcast editor and then do all your mixing and editing right in the, in the editor itself. I mean, it's pretty cool and it's a free download. So much appreciated. Okay, so before I close out this video, I wanted to share a little pro tip with you to make sure you don't have any problems or issues with buzzing or humming noises. And the pro tip is simply this. This, my friends, is an attenuator cable. Now, you notice it's different on the line end port and the, the port that's going to your camera, okay? Now, I get it. Some of you guys may not be running from your podcaster, device, mixer, whatever, going into your camera, but I am, so you need to be aware of this. If you try to go from your line out port to your camera without one of these, it's very likely you're going to get a humming, hissing, or buzzing noise. Okay, and I'll put a, l a link to the description for this cable. It's not expensive. It's like 15 bucks, something like that. Um, but without this, and I'm going to show you an example right now, um, you will get all manner of different noises uh, coming into your camera because the signal coming from the line out, it's a lot hotter than what your DSLR's preamp is going to be able to handle. So you need to attenuate it down. And so let's do that now. Okay, so right now I can hear the buzzing in the headphones because I'm going from the quarter inch line out directly to the 3.5 millimeter. So now let's add in the Movo line to mic cable and see what happens. Okay, so right away I can tell that the buzzing noise is gone because I have the headphones going directly to the FX30 to monitor the signal. And so, problem solved. What I'm trying to show you simply is that the line out signal is quite hot and your most DSLRs won't handle it. So you're gonna need some kind of attenuation. And this cable is a good option. It gives you about 25 minus uh, 25 dBs of attenuation. And typically that solves the problem. So that's your pro tip for this video. So to wrap up this video, I think it's pretty obvious that this was born out of my not so great experience with the Rodecaster Duo. And from that, I stumbled onto the Tascam Mixcast 4, which has turned out to be a perfect device for me because I have a number of mics that I demonstrated can play very well with this unit. Ultimately, what I wanted to show is that the Rode devices really lean towards using Rode mics with those units. Whereas with the M4, you can use a wider range of mics 
and achieve good results. Now, let's not lose sight of the fact that the M4, the Duo, and the Pro 2 are really designed for podcasting and recording multiple mics simultaneously. But as I've clearly stated, my end goal is a little different, and I just find it hard to plunk down $1,000 for a Mix Pre 3 over the $400 for an M4 and get less functionality for my hard-earned dineros. But hey, I get it, everyone's use cases will vary, so you really need to think about what your needs are. If you want a unit that can go straight into your camera via the built-in 3.5 millimeter port, can record multiple mics, gives you some flexibility to modify the sound coming out of existing mics, comes with a free software processing app, can record your iPhone through the TRS port, can record your sessions to SSD cards, allows for interesting sound effects, has a front-facing TRS port for monitoring and recording, then you might want to take a look at this unit provided you have the space for its footprint. Ultimately, I think the M4 is worth a look if you're serious about your audio. If you found this info of value, kindly hit the subscribe, like, and notification bell for me, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers, man.